What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Everything Virtual. This is our first episode of our new series, State mm-hmm. of VR. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am Zane. This is Ronnie. <laughs> it's actually kind of weird. We've never done something with video before, so um, yeah, this is this is new for us. But we're excited about it, and yeah. we. Uh, if anything is super awkward, like us looking in the wrong place or not exactly knowing what we're doing, like we'll get better. We'll get better. Yeah, we'll get better. So I'm not worried about it. I'm excited because this is specifically for our YouTube channel. If you guys are listening on the audio version of this, uh, just know that we actually now have a video version up on YouTube uh, where you can watch us literally do the same thing, just talking <laughs> video. So, uh, but we're excited about it. We wanted to do a lot more with uh, our YouTube channel. So this is a going to be a YouTube specific show that we are going to try to run once a month. Uh, starting now in yeah. October. So uh, we wanted to cover some of the big topics. Um, as we go along, we have more ideas for what we want this show to be. Uh, but for this time around, like we said, it is the introduction for what this is, I guess, episode one of the state of VR. Uh, and so we just wanted to cover some of the big news topics and kind of go from there. What do you think, yeah. Ronnie? Yeah, no, let's, let's hit it. There's actually, I mean... I think this is going to be an interesting discussion because a lot of really big topics came up. I don't know how much we've had a chance to think them through prior to recording today. We, so, or, or even talk about them. Yeah, this is really the, going to be just camera. like, yeah, right before that, like I've been seeing this stuff kind of pop up on Twitter, pop up online, and I've, I obviously have a lot of thoughts on them, but it was one of those things when we came here and sat down and, and devised a list for what we wanted to talk about on this first video show. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of heavy hitters here. So, yeah. So let's, uh, let's knock out. I, I don't know if we should start with this one now. Cause I feel like it's not as big of a heavy hitter <laughs> and maybe we don't have much to comment on. We'll get but, rid of it first. Right. Uh, then, we'll, we'll, we'll get it out of the way. Yeah. And that is vibe cosmos. So clearly you can see how excited we are about the release of the vibe cosmos. Um, now, that being said, neither of us have tried it, but what we wanted to just kind of focus on was the fact that um, the reviews haven't been so positive. I mean, yeah. what have you heard? No, so, yeah, I did give my kind of initial impressions on one of the earlier episodes before it was released. So uh, for people who haven't been following the the Vive Cosmos, essentially this is HTC Vive's second consumer-focused fo- uh, headset. So they, as most people know uh, that are probably listening to us, uh, HTC initially released their first headset, the Vive, in 2016. And that was a consumer-focused device, but it also kind of bled over a little bit into, you know, it was used all over the place because it was really the best he- headset on the market. At the time, yeah. yeah. For, for like the whole year, I'd say, even after the touch controllers came out. Yep. And then I want to say sometime like late 2018, mid to late 2018, uh, they released a follow-up, which they didn't really term a follow-up to the Vive per se, but it was the Vive Pro. And the Vive Pro was basically, you know, as the moniker would suggest, a better version of the Vive. It used Base Station 2.0, which, you know, were, were newer technology for the tracking, but pretty much the same, just allowed for kind of bigger spaces and more track devices, that sort of thing. Uh, but the key differentiator was that the the screen itself was much higher resolution. So, And the only caveat to that, I think uh, it would have caught on more for the consumer market if the price had been kind of in line, but it wasn't. It was, you know, $1,000, I think, for just the headset and like 1400 for kind of the whole package. But I mean, uh, it wasn't really priced for consumers no, either. It wasn't. You saw Oculus was, focus bringing their prices down. 100%. So I, I felt like they were really going for that enterprise market yeah. rather than the consumer and, market. And, and that was, I think that was like a very, like, a, a, you know, a pointed it was intentional. strategy position yeah. on there. And like they wanted, yeah, they, they saw that the enterprise uh, sector was fairly large and there was a lot of, uh, excitement around VR for for enterprise, and so they they focus on delivering a product to, to those people. Uh, basically, if you think about it, it's just like a, an amped up Vive for people that can afford more than that that are where price isn't a 
Price but, wasn't really a concern. Yeah. yeah. So then, so so now, you know. Although, th- to be said, you did say you tried the Vive Pro and were super tempted to get it just I because was. of it, the difference. Yeah, it was, I mean, it's it was slick hardware and the resolution really made a big difference. That was, uh, I, I, I wanted the high fidelity tracking of the Vive, but I wanted a better screen and that kind of solved for both of those. So, but yeah, the price point was just too high. And I was still like, I, I still think if people bought, uh, if they were really into to VR and bought a Vive Pro when it first launched, um, it's still a really good headset. So as long as, I mean, depending on what you want to do controllers wise, I, I think you could get Valve Index controllers or uh, or just stick with the wands for that matter. But honestly, I still think the Vive Pro in a lot of ways still competes at the high high end. High Though end, I yeah. do think the, the index is better, but the index also came out like a full year later. So uh, I, I think right now, if I were to suggest a headset, I would definitely suggest the index. But if you were an early adopter of the Vive Pro, I think it's held its own, and I don't think it was necessarily like a bad move. But anyways. Okay, I was so, just going to say, we kind of went down the Vive yeah. rabbit hole here. So, so let's bring it back to the Cosmos. So, so now the Cosmos. So the Cosmos is really their HTC Vive's ne- second attempt at a consumer headset. And this is also the first time that they've created a headset. Uh, eh, I shouldn't say that. They also created the Focus, which we won't get into, but that was their sta- that is their standalone device. So that's kind of separate and, again, has more of an enterprise focus, I would say, that especially uh, price point-wise, uh, you know, comparing it to the Quest. But so now, you know, PC-based VR, their next consumer-focused headset, the HTC Vive Cosmos. And they've been teasing it for a while now, like probably well over a year at this point. I'm not yeah. sure. But they really weren't giving there, out much information. There was information. so much hype because you heard about the Quest coming out and the Cosmos, but there wasn't as much information yeah. until and, much later. Yeah, and, and at one point, like they had kind of, and they still are to some degree, they were kind of suggesting that it might be able to connect to your PC or a phone. They were like, so essentially making it kind of like a standalone device. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, but it wasn't really clear. And then they they kept on saying that, you know, new announcements were going to come, but then the announcement would just be like more B footage, B-roll footage of the device or something. Like, yeah. It was just... So anyway, so they kept on... Right before launch, like about a month in advance, they finally, I think, released the price point and they made an announcement on when it was going to ship. And you could pre-order that day. And on that announcement, they also made they suggested that it was going to be for for like six ninety nine, seven hundred bucks. That includes the headset itself and the controllers. It doesn't require any kind of you know outside sensors or anything. All of that was built in. And then they suggested that this was going to be both. This was basically the most. Uh, it was like a, a headset that is meant to be upgradable for the future. And they talked about how. It can kind of do everything. It has inside-out tracking with its own sensors, but that in the future they're going to release a plate that you like a a, a front cover that allows it to be compatible with Steam VR if you use uh, Lighthouse-based tracking. So they're saying, oh, it can do tracking on its own, but we're going to release like a one to two hundred dollar up like uh, faceplate in the future that will let you uh, utilize Steam VR. Uh, lighthouse based tracking in the future if you want that kind of high fidelity experience. So it was kind of a little, little bit of a weird mix. And when yeah. I read that, like I was excited on one hand because, yeah, lighthouse based tracking is the best. But on the other hand, I, I thought it was a little bit weird that I was like, does that mean that their, that their own uh, tracking that they have built into the headset isn't going to be as good? Like, I, like I, I was kind of curious. And yeah. It, I so, mean, so when I, so when I, I recorded my kind of impressions mm-hmm. that day, this is before people were really getting real hands-on impressions with the hardware. I kind of said, yeah, it, I think it's, it's too expensive. And I'm just not sure about, you know, the timing of all of this and everything. And since when it finally yeah. came out, I mean, people are having all kinds. I mean, the biggest complaints have been with the tracking. And it sounds like the tracking is just not up to par. It just has a lot of tracking issues, the most damning of which, and I've heard it's gotten better. And to HTC Vive's credit, I have heard that they they have definitely made some improvements since its launch. 
but it was kind of one of those things. Yeah, they're 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 making improvements, but they have still a long list to go. So so people are kind of wary. But um, the one of the biggest complaints I heard that had me really like skeptical was that people apparently, in order for the the cameras to be able to see the environment, you know how the yeah. quest requires some kind of light mm-hmm. in order to track. Like apparently, people are, are playing it in like like a room like this that seems pretty lit. And it's like, we need more light, like shutting down. And it like won't let them play even though they have a lot of lights on. So like stuff like that is yeah. like really, like it's not it's like minor fr- things. It's frustrating though, yeah. right? So, I mean, for me, like uh, when, when I heard about it, when I was reading about, up on it, um, too little, too late, and too expensive. Yeah. Like that's just, I mean, the, when you when you compare something like that to the Quest or the Rift S, and I know maybe they're trying to future proof this to a certain extent, and that's the value that they're trying to provide uh, with this hardware. But I guess, and uh, I'll admit, maybe maybe my perspective is a little short sighted, but I just don't see it right now because for me, the you know where Oculus is at with the Quest uh, and with Rift S, what they have consumer ready at this point is is better, and you have to. You have to know that they're going to be working to improve that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just it was a little underwhelming, especially uh, as big of HTC fans and, and Vive fans as as we are, because we want yeah, all. I mean, we want we want we want this, good competition. I'll we be want honest, good hardware yeah. out there. At, at this point, like Valve, they released their headset, and it's 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 great, but it uh, but it does have issues. Like it's not it's not perfect. Um, I'd say if anyone has been kind of more consumer friendly in terms of like making really solid dependable hardware it's been oculus but there's obviously a lot of concerns with you know facebook owning oculus and exclusivity and like you know how oculus plays with you know indie develop like there's just all kinds of we want you want all of these major players to be as strong as possible i think htc was really in a good position and still could potentially remain in a good position to be like, you know, one of the major players in this market along with Oculus. Like I, I think I think Valve is more interested in software. Yeah, I mean that's always been their thing, right? So So I I, I just know even with them releasing the index, I just don't see them as necessarily being like a long term player on the hardware side. And so if if HTC Vive doesn't do that, I think more things are going to be more and more you know, an Oculus is kind of ballpark, which like after we left OC6, I mean, I, if they're going to continue to put all of the money and resources into making their products great, then you can't really argue with that. Like they, they make great products. Um, it's just competition is always key to maintaining yeah. a healthy ecosystem. So mm-hmm. you want, I, I like I, so I, I hope that HTC kind of turns all of this stuff around it's interesting, like, yeah, I just, it, they're also in the position where they need to make money off the hardware, probably. Yeah. And that that's probably a big reason that they priced this thing where they priced it. Oculus, not concerned with making money. I, I have no idea if Valve is concerned with making money on the hardware or not. Um, but well, I, th- I mean, the thing is, they so they took their software play with Viveport, right? Trying to be the Netflix of, uh, of I guess, VR software. Yeah. But I, to me... Facebook is taking the age-old video game model. You're gonna, probably going to lose money on all the hardware, but where they make it up is the software, right? And they're yeah. very, very curated about the software that they have yeah. uh, so that you know these games are all selling well. There's yeah. no bad experiences, people who try it. Um, whereas, I mean, if we're being honest, like Netflix has yet to, to really be a profitable company, right? So yeah. I don't know that that was the best play on either the hardware or the software side. So uh, that being said, Oculus threw a hell of a counterpunch, right? So I just hope. Well, sorry. I, let me let me let me take this a step back. Coming out of the gates, HTC did really well. The Vive was a fantastic piece of hardware through 2016, 2017, probably even 2018, right? Um, and then Oculus came out with a hell of a counterpunch. So it's it's in HTC's corner now. I'd like to see them rise up to the occasion, and yeah. you know, within the next couple of years, I'd like to see what they can do to kind of up the ante. Yeah, and and I and I want them to. We are we are rooting for them too. Um, we it's not a it's not a we want competition. I was just about to say it's not a competition, but we want we want solid competition because we want 
uh, the best innovation to to come out there and be available for for folks like ourselves to enjoy. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to like speculate on what strategy could may or may not have worked with HTC Vive, but yeah, I think one thing is clear: it's just a product like this. Like, if if you can't make the, I mean, they they kind of saw who who knows kind of what led to when they wanted to release it and the delays and all that stuff, but it was really clear that. Oculus had really, really great inside out tracking with their insight system on the Quest and the Rift S. And if you're going to bring a headset that can't compete in terms of tracking when your past headset had the best tracking on yeah. the market, like <laughs> like that's that's a problematic. Like I think they need to understand who their base is and what made the Vive special as popular and as try it was, to work yeah. off of that. Like what if I mean, and, and again, I don't know exactly what their relationship is with Valve at this point, um, whether they're able, like how willing Valve is to allow people to use the, the Steam VR tracking anymore. And we probably shouldn't anymore. speculate on that because no. I'm sure a lot of this is happening behind closed doors anyway. But like, but it would totally be, it would have been super interesting for them to release like a cheaper headset that allowed you to use Lighthouse-based tracking or something. Like, yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, they, they, like they could have maybe... Yeah, like I said, like there's people out there that want a high end product, but not necessarily like not necessarily the index. Like maybe they don't want to spend a thousand. Like I don't know. You maybe you could have done some kind of a side upgrade or something. Eh, who knows? But I mean, look at the end of the day, like we wanted Gen two or even Gen one and a half to really take those steps, um, and it just it just didn't seem in comparison to what's out there. Yeah. It just didn't seem like it was you know. Three and a half years later, it just doesn't seem like uh, it's what what people wanted or what yeah. people are excited about. So, like I said, we spent a lot more time on this than I think we were planning to. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm still excited to see what HCC can do. I hope this doesn't become a insurmountable kind of bump in the road for them. Yeah. Uh, so, just hopefully a learning experience that they'll be able to uh, to kind of come back into the VR market and present a new, fresh, innovative idea that uh, hasn't been there like they did the first time around. Uh, awesome, man. So this next one, I don't, we should probably stop saying that they're not all heavy hitters, right? Because I guess they're all pretty big. Yeah. But the Gear VR and yep. Daydream are done. Yep. That's crazy. So we're are we done with mobile VR? Like, what That's are your thoughts what, on this? Yeah, that was kind of so. Yeah, at OC six, uh, John Carmack kind of made the the eulogy for the uh, the Gear VR, kind of announcing its you know end of end of life, and officially saying that they're going to try to bring a lot of that software over to the Quest, which they recently did uh, to some extent with the uh, with the latest Quest patch. Mm-hmm. Though I haven't had a chance to try out uh, any any of any of that software yet. I'm trying to think actually, was that I'm trying to remember if they've actually no, that probably they were bringing over I think Oculus Go content maybe to the Quest. But anyways, whatever. Point is uh, Gear VR is done. And John Carmack went on a long kind of explanation as to kind of things they did wrong, things they could have done better, missed opportunities, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was that was a you know at OC six, so like you know pushing on like in in mid mid September ish. Then just a couple of days ago, so you know early you know around mid October now for those who are watching this after the fact, um, Google had their unveiling of the pixel four mm-hmm. and alongside of that basically made the announcement pixel four isn't supporting daydream it's not doing any kind of vr and they're they're no longer going to be selling kind of the clamshell daydream kind of headset thing i, I never owned a daydream so i don't know all the details there but yeah i i mean i think it, and none of this was really a surprise like i don't think anyone saw the daydream announcement like as as I'm perusing Twitter and the internet and seeing what people are saying <laughs> about like it wasn't like they were super super pushing it or anything like this is like a big deal to them even yeah it was just kind of one of those things like they did it for a while and now they they don't think they need need to be doing it I really do think to some extent the death of three off VR which those two devices were. You know, they three degrees of freedom for yeah. those uh, who may not know. Um, I think the death of that really can be attributed probably to the success of the quest. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I 
I'm okay with it. Yeah, I'm okay with it because I think we've seen what uh, what we I, sh- I don't know why I'm saying we, but what we are. Fine, I'm just gonna say what we as uh, as a species are capable of when it comes to tetherless uh, VR, right, or just completely wireless and on its own VR uh, with the Quest. Yeah. So I would rather they take their resources and build off that. I mean, my only I, I need I would like less things to drain my phone battery as it is anyway. So yep. um, you know the if if we can like I said if we can focus on just developing the Oculus Quest into more of what we dream the no, no pun intended but what what we dream VR to actually be then I think it's a better use of time and resources. I mean, I really think long term what the quest may eventually become is what VR is going to be, which is you have a standalone headset that works on it by itself when it needs to, but then when you need it to, it'll connect to something external like a PC or something and allow for more power, power, more, you know, visually impressive kind of, yeah. I mean, as phones and if phones become even more powerful with the type of computing they can do, yeah. Um, you know, I wonder how much of the workload and processing they would be able to do in let's say like 5 to 10 years yeah. so that you're maybe just carrying a very simple like plain goggles or something, right? Yeah. Uh, and and are able to connect over that Bluetooth again. I'm speaking from complete technical ignorance, but yeah. I'm just saying if the if the technology was able to get there where uh, the the wireless data transfer was to be enough that you See, could, the, you know what I mean where yeah. where your the the phone could still could be the workhorse. That's what I mean. Clearly, John Carmack really believed that mobile like using a cell phone to power a headset was could really be a powerful thing. And I mean, some of what he talked about were kind of the lessons learned of like I guess it's uh, like one of the biggest detractors from preventing people of from trying VR is just like they didn't want to waste their battery and like their like they use their phone so much they didn't want to waste a lot of its battery playing a game or <laughs> yeah. or like they didn't or uh, like it the ease at which you're able to fit your device into the headset was like something people didn't want to do. Yeah. The f- the fact that uh, should I No, just keep going. Okay. Yeah. I think it should start automatically by itself. Yep, I think we're good. Okay. Um the fact that let me get back my train of thought. We can edit this. Um or we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Not just However going. this so, goes up. Well, you were um, talking about John Carmack. Oh, and yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, the fact that most people use their cell phones in cases. So now mm-hmm. not only is do you have to, like, put your cell phone into, like, you have to take it out of one case, put it into, like, another case. Yeah. And, like, all these little hassles that are, don't seem like they'd be that big of a deal end up being kind of a big deal to people. And so I wonder just, I mean, who knows what, devices we'll be using in the future like if we're going to be using yeah. phones in like 10 years but like yeah I, I i guess it was this was their experiment to kind of show that that the, that those inconveniences might be enough to make that form factor not a thing like people might rather just have mm-hmm. a like a quest like a quest essentially has the same technology of, of a cell phone in it but you just don't have to like it has its own battery and yeah it's like you don't have to take something in and out or all of that. Like I, you, yeah, yeah. No, I mean the thing is like I. So this is such a random example, but this morning I saw somebody on the train playing with a Nintendo Switch. Right. Yeah. Now the thing is, you can play games on your phone, but the Switch obviously provides something of value uh, and is and offers certain types of gameplay. Right. So I, I think that separation is always going to be there, right? Yeah. Like phones are amazing and they're great for everything that they're capable of. Yeah. But um, I think having a dedicated gaming device yeah. will always be something separate. And maybe not even gaming, but just like VR for whatever yeah. VR is going to be needed for. So cool. I don't know. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with mobile yeah. VR I'm being, totally okay being with over. It. That's what so. we're, I was never fan, a big fan of like, even if like the daydream headset could kind of do like six degrees of freedom with the headset, like, Anything that requires you to pivot a little controller and not yeah. move your hands around is like a problem. No, nah, I'm good. So cool, man. Okay. 
So this next one, I uh, let's let's not dive too deep in because I think we'll need to do a full on review for Asgard's Wrath. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, some of the things you were telling me about, because since I I only have a quest and a vibe, so I haven't had a chance to try it out yet. Yeah. Although, uh, just a reminder for those of you wanting to play Oculus games, the the Oculus Link will be available in November, so just a month away. So I'm excited about that. But Asgard's Wrath. I mean, you were telling me this thing has 25 hours of gameplay. Yeah. That's AAA level, isn't it? Are, yeah. we, are we getting there? Are we close? Yeah, I think we're... I mean, Asgard's Wrath is really impressive. It's hard to explain why it feels like it's... Like, I've played a lot of VR titles that feel like they're solid, well-rounded packages. Like, it's like, you know, this is a full game. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's something about Asgard's Wrath that even though I haven't ha- put as much time in yet as I want to, it just feels like... There's a lot to do. I don't. I don't know if it's just because it, it has a similar kind of pacing to like a, a traditional console game, but it just feels like there's a huge world in front of me, and that there's like a lot of things just all around that I can engage with. And like, on one hand, it definitely like isn't perfect in terms of like I don't. You don't get to re- interact with everything in the world. Yeah. Like yeah. it's not like. Like, oh, there's, like, you can go in a room and see something on a table and sometimes not be able to pick something up, which frustrates me. So, like, those kind of things, I'm like, man, Valve's upcoming title can't come sooner because <laughs> I think they'll get that stuff right. I hope so, yeah. Um, but I, I also just want to quickly comment and say that I, I feel like at some point we are going to have to potentially drop that criticism. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, well, because the thing is, like, I think I want to be able to, like, look at something as a whole, right? Like, yeah. how, how is the overall experience? Like, I don't want to get caught up on, like, old I, VR. Yeah, or just expectation. Like, exactly. Like, rather than having individual. I, and I agree. That's 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 why I'm saying, like, at first, when I started playing it, those things kind of stood out to like, me. But then, but then I just, pl- like, just, like, whatever. Who cares? Like, once you actually play and just get used to the world mm-hmm. and, like, there's a lot of really, really cool things that they're doing just like in terms of atmosphere and like, I don't know. I, you just, I just really felt engaged in the world in a way that a lot of games don't make me feel. So yeah. I, my only analogy for that is uh, uh, just to kind of clarify the point um, for, for listeners is that is like, I'm thinking about 10, 15 years ago to like uh, Grand Theft Auto, for example, right? Sure. Uh, you can open the doors of cars and get in. You can go, you can do a, a bunch of crazy stuff in the yeah. game, but you can't open a door and get inside of a building. Yeah. But I guess what I'm trying to say is um, even with all of that, that didn't ruin the game for me, right? That fact that I could get into certain things, but not others. Yeah. So I, I, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Where like, I feel like at some point, I just mentally want to be able to evaluate a game. For sure. More on that. And, and maybe yeah. maybe what I'm saying is actually completely incorrect because yeah, yeah. the thing is like vr is such a different animal that a lot of the natural tendencies that you would have would be to do those things and, and if they if it never exactly. comes to fruition you will always feel that That's, so yeah that could be That's the case it, it's just something i'm trying to be more cognizant of yeah no I, I agree i think i think the proper way to handle it i think skilled game makers kind of know how to create a world where those expectations aren't broken like like yeah. I, I think the best situation like if I, and see, in a game like Asgard's Wrath, again, like I think it's a balance. Like you can't have a super detailed, hyper realistic environment, and also be interact, interact, and also have everything be interactive, and also have everything look the best it can. Mm-hmm. And also, like, it's clear they wanted something that was going to be visually very impressive, yeah, and on par with like games that people are used to playing on, you know, traditionally, and they were able to do that in it probably wasn't very feasible to like, there's still a decent amount of interaction. Like, like I, if this was a traditional game, I mean, the amount of interaction you can do is far greater than that. True. Yeah. So it's kind of like, where do you draw the line? These are all hard. Like these are res- like how much resources do you want to, you know, put towards one thing versus another. And I, exactly. I think after playing it more, like you said, after playing it more, I think they made the right decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just one of those things like, oh, this is kind of a different game than it is kind of more of a console like experience in a VR game, but it doesn't go too far out of either way. Like it brings all of the things that I like about traditional games to VR while keeping, while also taking advantage of the medium in a, in a pretty good way. So that's why I want to, I, I want to reserve my right to kind of critique it more and 
both positively and negatively once I've gotten through it completely. Because yeah, and because because this is a game that deserves that. Yeah, I'll say that I agree. I'll say that one thing that kind of it, like my early impression after playing it for you know two or three hours probably was like, wow, this is awesome. I can't wait to show my brother who hasn't really gotten into VR quite yet. Like he just hasn't had a lot of exposure to it. He he when he comes to my place, he gets to play for a little bit, but he those 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 amount that amount of time has kind of been few and far between. Yeah. So I was like, "Oh, this is going to be perfect for him because he plays a lot of traditional games. This game looks amazing. It's what very did, what immersive." Did he, think? he really liked it, but he only played for about 30 minutes because he was starting to feel sick. Yeah. Because it has Okay. Because it has it has to, like th- I this is a game that I don't think will make like like I felt fine, and if I you've been playing get... VR, you have some like built yeah. up some VR so, legs. Yeah, so so I fine. just I just kind of wonder like to what extent um, some of these really amazing AAA games are they're going to be so awesome from a technical level. Like on one hand, they they bring the opportunity of bringing folks that haven't tried VR to the table because they can see these screenshots of the games, they can see and it's, like they see the big developers behind them. They get super excited. They want to play, but then if they're going to play and not be able to appreciate it because of these kind of things like yeah. getting sick or that. So I, I don't know. So I, like, like I said, the jury's still out, I think in terms of how that stuff is going to go. And yeah, I, I still value, I think smaller titles that uh, can, can manage those types of issues a little bit better, but cool. Matt. Well, I, uh, I do look forward to trying it. Um, I will probably wait until we get the Oculus link in November. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, maybe we can chat more about it. Hopefully, you'll be able to give your review before then. Yeah. Uh, but we can probably do something a little bit more in depth later on in the year. Maybe when we do, a, we'll do like a 2019 wrap up at some point. I think that'd yeah. be kind of fun. No, that would be good. All right, let's go ahead and actually wrap this episode up with um, talk about Beat Saber. Yep. So, custom song support on the Quest has been taken out, and uh, I'm I'm looking at an upload VR article here which we'll actually link to in the show notes um i'm not going to read the thing here because it's got a lot of legal stuff in there but the the main thing is that facebook and oculus updated their content guidelines and their policies and it looks like SideQuest is no longer available which is the way that they were well, uploading the, no, I, the so songs. side quest i'm sorry still, go but, ahead but yeah i think and I'm not reading the article either, so <laughs> oh, I might be. It, it's beat on, I think. Oh, is you're no right. No longer right. supporting beat, like beat autom- on, yeah, automated the, song adding. Beat on are withdrawing support after the new content guidelines update. So the thing is, I I mean, we can comment on this, but I feel like there's a lot of legal stuff in the background that I'm sure not many folks fully understand, and that's to me that's probably why it was just safer for them to remove support. I mean, when I'm thinking about just like all the copyright issues that, for example, YouTube had to go through in order to be able to monetize and pay out creators, I'm sure that's just a headache nobody wants to deal with until it's uh, either either solved or streamlined in a way that nobody has to worry about yeah. getting um, no, I mean, know, in trouble legally. All the, all the custom song stuff for Beat Saber is awesome on one hand. But on the other hand, I was always, like, especially when I saw how Beat On worked with SideQuest and how like in your face it was about, hey, just download all these songs, upload them. Like, yeah. It was so yeah. like obviously like probably not super... I mean, it's pirated at the end yeah. of the day, right? So, like, so, so, like, when I saw it, I was always kind of in my head wondering, like, how is this possible? Like, yeah. I guess just no one cares, and and so, like, and the interesting thing about this is, I mean, on one hand, you can look at it as, man, this this sucks. Like, we don't get the downloadable songs for the quest anymore. On the other hand, I feel like Oculus was pretty good about kind of giving people a heads up. Like, they did kind of what they needed to do on their end. To make to make it clear yeah. that they weren't okay with 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 you know people abusing copyright, but at the same time, it's not like they like went out and like sent a cease and desist letter to anybody or like as well, far as we know. Yeah, well, I mean, I think they they changed it. Uh, they probably changed their the Oculus platform abuse policy in a way that made it very explicitly clear that they were not, not going to be held liable and that yeah. anything that came by. 
um, would be on on any yeah. third party. So and so third parties then yeah. When and so and so I mean when, when that, yeah when they're confronted with something as explicit as that, it's probably easier to just take a step back yeah. and kind of. So I'm just saying they could have like I mean all any of this whole situation could have went down a lot worse. Like it could have been Oculus coming down on them really hard. It could have been it could have yeah. been someone filing lawsuits against Beat On or. And like, who knows? We might see that in the next thirty days. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say that this. I, I'm not. I'm not upset with them for taking a preemptive move to avoid some legal issues. I know. Yeah. I know many folks are probably gonna cry foul about it, and I understand because we want these things. But uh, I do very much appreciate. You know, as creators, I I do very much appreciate Oculus and uh, and Beat on kind of taking that a little bit seriously and making sure there's a path for creators to take advantage of that. I, I really. <laughs> what are you thinking? That I was just thinking like. I, I, I don't know what the logistics of this would be and, like, how you could make it work. But, man, wouldn't it be awesome? It would be so cool if you could have, like, a Netflix-type subscription to all kinds of... So- like, like what if... I don't know. Yeah, see, but that, it's just not songs? possible. Yeah, it would be so cool if, if uh, you could somehow... Like, if somehow you could have, like, a huge library of songs... And people were still able to make custom tracks with them, but you could just pay like a certain amount per month. I, I think Beat Saber ultimately, and feel free to take this idea, guys. Beat Saber just needs to partner with a Spotify or Apple Music yeah. or someone like that. Because then if all of those songs are available and people are able to use them and at the end of the day, creators are compensated, even if it's pennies for their work. Yeah. Um, you know, that's at, at the end of the day, it's it everything. All the boxes are checked. So I mean, I, none of these artists. I mean, I highly doubt most artists are really like. Obviously, they've had some like uh, music tra- packs and stuff like that that have come out. Panic for disc for the disco. Is Panic the for the disco. Yeah. But yeah, but like, but in general, there, most artists aren't going to probably have their music licensed for Beat Saber. Like, yeah. So like, I'm just saying, like, like I agree with you in terms of like, I think it would be an opportunity for people to make a little bit more money. Well, I I think it's an opportunity for people to make money, but also uh, even like creative partnerships, right? Like, yeah. I mean, as as an independent musician myself, like I would totally be on board to do something like that, where creating music or using the music in in a way to kind of combine that in VR, I think would be really cool. But um, I'm, I'm sure we'll see something like the fact that the fact that we are seeing these packs from Panic at the Disco. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that as we go along. But my hope is. Along the lines of something that what you were saying earlier, where it's more of like an all you can eat model or yeah. subscription based model, where um, e- even if it's like an add on add on price or something like like that, or if you have maybe if you have like a Spotify premium um, profile that you're able to attach to it that uses your account, yeah, uh, things like that, I think would be a re- really cool way for um, for that collaboration to happen. I just know, I mean, know. I would be willing to spend money on that per month or whatever. yeah, right. Like, so I, I bet they would make so much money. Yeah. Yep. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, just to just to give people a heads up on where things stand, uh, I'm going to quote this directly because I think Upload VR did a fantastic job. So now we've got Beat Saber on PC, which can fully mod songs and allow users to tweak and change the game however they'd like. We also have Beat Saber on Quest, which will now require using side quests to manually alter the game rather than having a mod to automate it potentially risking your Oculus account in the process. So highlight that part. And then Beat Saber on PSVR with zero custom song support. So that's where Beat Saber kind of stands. Beat Saber custom songs stand along all the different platforms. But, um, you know, this game is too popular for it to be held down in any way. I'm sure with how, you know, all the all the fanfare and, and just kind of the hype around it, um, yeah, they're going to find a creative solution. I'm, I'm pretty confident about that. Yeah. No, I hope so. And I hope that... Oculus doesn't take any kind of weird like this whole situation has been murky because I don't know that it's been super clear to people that have been using these mods that it is or isn't okay to use mm-hmm. songs and like I said I I'd rather them find a way to make it not work and not allow for custom tracks yeah than for accounts to be flagged or something like that like let people kind of figure out on their own that this isn't something that they can pursue anymore rather than getting people I think in trouble for something that has been kind of a like a prevalent use of the yeah. of the hardware. But cool, man. Well, that wraps up the show for us. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for the first ever state of VR 
video podcast show. Is there a word for that? I don't know. No, oh, whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> but, Ho- hope you guys liked our uh, our set. Yeah. And our... uh, this will probably change <laughs> in the future. Uh, but we're glad we could get this episode out today. Next one will come out sometime in November. Uh, and if you guys have things that you would like to hear discussed, I mean, the point of this is for us to kind of tackle a lot of the bigger topics for the month uh, with this being a monthly show. So hit us up on Twitter, email, all that all that stuff will be in the show notes. But Ronnie, you good? I'm good. Awesome. All right, guys, we will catch you later. There will be more episodes on the audio version of the podcast, but this state of VR is for all of you YouTube folks. So thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you later.